Good afternoon, Des Moines, Iowa. Welcome to Doc and Lefty. This is Lefty back from his deathbed. I got to tell you, last week, uh, we're, and I should get into this really quick. We're at webcast1live.com every Tuesday night from 6 to 7 in the beautiful webcast1live.com studios on the Skywalk in, I don't know what you'd even call it, um, uh, ebullient, effervescent, uh, uh, insert adjective here, downtown Des Moines. Fantabulous. Fantabulous. It's it's great. I'm here with my good friend and partner in crime, the doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Bertroche. How Doc, doing, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, it was uh, rather kind of a scramble last week because I thought Phaedra could come and, and she couldn't. And then while we had uh, our um, uh, occasional co-host, uh, Mike Sporer, uh, he said he could come, and I walked into the studio and got a text that said, I forgot all about my girl's softball game. Oh, man. So, yeah. So, last week was, you know, kind of a, you know, well, I went I went wild on conspiracy theories. You, you, know you, I mean? you, so, rode, you rode solo without anybody. See, this is the thing that separates Doc from me. <laughs> Doc, for me, when I don't have anybody in the booth to talk to, I just run up a rerun. Doc can sit here and talk for an hour straight. I mean, it's only one tenth or one twelfth of his impresses what Wendy Davis did down in Texas, but still, it's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> well, so, yeah, whatever. We got a lot of we got a lot to talk about. Uh, uh, we're going over the agenda kind of back and forth today, and I know that you have been. I mean, obviously, um, and I, I was out sick last week, and uh, if you can, you kind of tell in my voice that I haven't quite kicked it. This this thing just will not go away. But, um, you know, back this week, a lot to talk about the Supreme Court uh, sort of in a schizophrenic. You can't whenever you try and pin the Supreme Court down on this is this is a civil rights year. It's not a civil rights year. They're always a little bit schizophrenic about it, it seems like to me. They're kind of from a civil rights standpoint, if you're a big civil rights person, the Voting Rights Act was a kind of a an issue, although from a league from just if I'm giving a legalistic two cent analysis of it, I mean, Legally, what they did was say the old mode doesn't make sense anymore. Quit using 40 year old uh, rules to interpret modern day racism. And that I think that's a pretty compelling argument from a political standpoint. You know that the Republicans in Congress aren't going to do anything. And it it uh, it validated all these laws that had been held up by the DOJ. And and so civil rights folks are saying that, that this is a big step back. And then you had. Uh, Proposition Eight being punted on, yes, basically, so that folk, <laughs> so that uh, LGBT couples in California can get married, and then DOMA Section Three of DOMA unconstitutional. And I know you wanted to get into this right away. Well, yeah, well, a couple of things. One of the things that frosted me this morning was seven billion dollars to power Africa. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Not that I don't think the Africans deserve power, but there's a couple of things in there that I don't like. As far as DOMA. Um, and the Supreme Court's ruling on it. Blake, can you just speak just for a second about the, the section three of this? Well, section section three of DOMA has to do with sort of like the federal benefits of the uh, of the uh, that are not being ex- that weren't extended to to LGBT couples who you know were married in states that allowed. Uh, uh, marriage equality. So if you were a, say that you were a, um, uh, a two, two soldiers in, um, in who are married in Iowa where it's, where it's legal to do so. And in a, in a gay relationship, for example, and you were transferred to a, st- um, to a state that didn't allow gay marriage under the old regime, you were not eligible for any of the, I mean, you, and you weren't eligible for them anyway, yeah. for, for a veteran, uh, uh, spouse benefits for, for the, the death benefits that happen for one, if one spouse survived the survivor benefits, things that are extended to children, that relationship wasn't recognized by the federal government. The Supreme court came in and said that they can't do that. It violates, um, the, uh, the, uh, equal liberty is, um, guaranteed by the fifth amendment. Yep. You don't see a lot of Fifth Amendment case or Fifth Amendment decisions outside of a criminal context. So that was a really interesting rationale, yeah. I thought. Well, one of the things that I pointed out the day that they ruled is um, one of the things they stumbled across on the campaign trail was, would I support a federal federal legislation for Defense of Marriage Act? My answer is no. And here's, here's very clearly the reason is 
this is a decision that should be left up to the states. Justice Robert is the one is the person that threw the deciding vote. He is a big states' right advocate. He did he was the swing vote on the Obamacare, and basically what he did is it punted it back to the uh, Congress so they could do their job and potentially the states. Um, the same thing with DOMA. They said, listen, that's the state's issue. That's how to look at this. The other thing about uh, Proposition 8, which they basically punted and said, you know. Uh, you don't have standing. Yeah. Uh, what they basically are saying, at least from what I read from my, in my layman terms, is there's so many property rights tied up with, the, with marriage and the law surrounding marriage that you really can't deny property rights simply based on marriage. Um, or uh, uh, be able to regulate marriage in such a way that they can't get married. And then it breaks down into, well, is it a religious thing, getting married, or is it something the state really has a right to, to legislate? And the states and the federal government have said repeatedly that they have the right to legislate marriage. Well, they don't have the right to legislate the religious aspects of the marriage. Well, the thing is... Um it was it, Kennedy's opinion, and I'll admit to everybody, it's you know I've been out sick for the last week, and I haven't had a chance to read the opinion. I don't. I've, I perused the syllabus. It gives you kind of a at the front of the opinion that gives you a nice it's synopsis a of, of what's of what's in it. But the reporting on it, there's a lot in the opinion about Kennedy citing the dignity uh, that that was sort of uh, being demeaned by by the Doma, by doma legislation basically and really the rationale that they came up with was hey you can't deny certain benefits to a class of people if you're going to extend that those benefits to another class of people and what's frustrating to me as someone that is that's been backing this for a long time is then just make the equal protection just just decide on equal protection grounds recognize homosexuals as a class that's historically been discriminated against and make a more coherent ruling saying that you're denying equal liberty just, um, just to, to to obtain a federal benefit for that other people can can receive it just well, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense but for me here's the problem if i mean let's say it, let's face it lgbt uh, community could have been discriminated against. That isn't the issue that we're going to be talking about during this show. The problem is, so is polygamous. Polygamous has been discriminated against, right? We even have laws that say you can't have polygamy. Well, where does this stop? Does it stop just with gay marriage? Or are we going to start having polygamous marriages that are okay? Are we going to start having uh, the National Alliance of Man-Boy Love Association the pedophiles are discriminated against. Are we going to start having people say, well, I can fall in love with the six year old girl, six year old boy, whatever, or 13 year old girl, boy, and we want to be married. Uh, Mary Kay Letourneau comes to mind. These cases can be, can be out there. So at what point do you say, well, when do you define marriage? How do you define it? Can anybody get married? And then if that's the case, there's always going to be a group out there that's going to feel discriminated against. There's always going to be a group that says, well, listen, do you have those rights? I should have these rights. That, but see, that I, do, I don't understand why every time this gets brought up, it goes from, man, we just we're really uncomfortable with two guys getting married and also pedophiles and also other and polygamists. And it just it, it, it tumbles downhill into the realm of the absurd. That's just ridiculous. Now, first of all, but, but it's not absurd. Oh, it's absolutely T absurd. I'll tell you why. Years ago, it wasn't absurd. I'll tell no, you, we're going to take a break. We're going to come right back. Lefty's going to tell us why it's absurd to sit there and, and force tell the future about how this is a big snowball rolling downhill. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on webcast one live dot com. How can I help you? Petrosian Associates will provide you with a friendly, caring, and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Petrosh, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. 
Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're uh, this doc and left. We're talking about DOMA for the first part of this show and giving our particular perspective on it. And and before the break, Doc had brought up the it seems like age old trope of we, you know, we don't want to allow marriage equality because then pedophiles will want to start being getting married to people. And I'll tell you why it's ridiculous and why it demean it really it demeans the the opposition and and is really part of what gave as given the game away culturally and why people just don't oppose um, same sex marriage anymore. First of all, if you're telling me that a, uh, a 25 year old guy and a 12 year old boy can enter into a, um, a marriage contract, we both know that on its face is just laughable. We don't let kids enter into con- any kind of contract, whether it be a marriage contract or one to buy cigarettes. We don't let them buy cigarettes either. Number two, you and I both know that the relation that a, that a relationship that's based on sex between a adult and a minor has been adjudged through years and years and years of research to be harmful and criminal. And so to normalize a relationship based on the commission of a crime, that's also not going to fly in the face of a marriage contract. The marriage in and of itself, and we're going to define marriage at all. We're going to define marriage as the union of two consenting people who enter into it willingly and freely and agree to share their lives, and their property together. That's what it is. That's also solemnized by a, a ceremony that has meaning to those two people. That could be at the, at the courthouse. That can be in a church or a mosque or wherever. And so to suggest that, that two people whether two people just in general, a, a child and an adult or or whatever it happens to be, would can be using the 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 uh, the rationale of allowing same sex marriage is just it. It doesn't serve the people that are against it at all. And it may, well, it's a laughable argument, but it's not a laughable argument, because if you look at it 30 years ago, it was inconceivable, inconceivable that homosexuality would be legitimized through marriage. We had sodomy laws on the books codified for at least, what, 150 years. Mm-hmm. Um, even, even in the 90s, it was really kind of inconceivable that these people would have gotten the, the, the gift of marriage uh, recognized by the state. So what I'm saying is your argument about, well, geez, you know, really looking down the future, having these other things happen really – you know, it's just silly. It isn't silly. Okay. Because 30 years ago, this is what it was. And I can tell you the National Alliance Man Boy Love Association, uh, strangely enough, I stumble into those guys once in a while in cases that I have in my office. All right. And I'm going to tell you they are active and they want to say, well, listen, these contracts that, you know, people can't sign contracts till they're 18. Right. Unless their parents sign the contract and the rest of it. These people are pushing to repeal those laws. They're pushing to decrease the age of sexual consent. And, you know, at what point do you go? Well, hold on. How do you define this? Now, if you define it as just between one man and one woman or two men and two women and you just limit it to two people. What about people that, you know, Fall in love with two or three people. I mean, there's a series called polyamory. There's a, di- there's a difference and, between pedophilia and polygamy or polygyny. A, well, a I, gigantic I, difference. Well, and I'm and I'm not saying that they're together. I'm not saying, and I'm not advocating for either one of these. What I am saying is, there are people out there that that are pushing for polyamory, and they're pushing for the 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 pedophilia pedophilic laws is the only way I can describe them. There are people that are pushing for that. There's a show called polyamory. What if you, why limit it to two people then? Mm -hmm. Because then if you have a third person come in, aren't you denying them the same property rights? First of all, what I can tell you is from if, if 
there is if the situation were to arise where the state could be satisfied that a polygamous relationship was not sort of abusive or um, uh, where where all the spouses were treated equally and 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 there was cohesion and harmony in the household. Personally, in, in my personal opinion, I have no problem with polygamous relationships. That's what that's up to you. If you want to do that, that's fine. And if and uh, if the state wants to recognize that sort of stuff, that would be a, that. Once again, that would be a cultural shift. I don't think that you there's no you can't get married to more than one person. And I don't know that the bigamy laws, if there's a criminal component to them at all in the in the states where bigamy is a problem, I don't rec, I don't think that they're very stringent penalties. I haven't re- I've done well, any sort of research. You, you face jail time and a penalty just like everything else, but they really don't pursue it. You're right. They yeah. don't pursue it. And so what I'm saying is that so that's one that's one piece of it. If if as a country our culture um uh, moves in the direction of of sort of saying we don't care what you do at your house and your polygamous relationship really didn't have much to do with my married uh, my uh, heterosexual or homosexual relationship we don't care that's I mean that's that's a different thing when we're talking about pedophilia and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about allowing adults to marry children first of all the the tradition of signing contract first of all or, well not for signing contracts until you're an adult, a legally recognized adult at 18 years old, that's ingrained in our, that's common law. That, I mean, that's, we've, that has been a tradition passed down from the English for the last 700 years. That's not going in, that's not being changed anytime soon. And an interest group of pedophiles is not going to change that in our lifetime. I would put my money on it. Number two, the age of consent is a state's issue. Iowa, I believe it's 16. That as long as as long as the age difference isn't more than a couple of years, there's no crime there. Other states are lower than that even. And so the sexual but sexual consent is not legal consent to enter into a contract in that way. Yeah. And also, when we're talking about you, you, you have you have treated homosexuals. And you have treated people in a homosexual relationship throughout your career. Yes, yes. And I by have. your own professional observation and by your own statements on this show you have stated that there is that a that you can have a healthy homosexual relationship with your partner in exactly the same way as a as a healthy heterosexual relationship but i would put it to you that you would never accept the idea that an adult human can have a healthy sexual amorous relationship with a child it just and it, I agree. it doesn't ha- it's abuse and it doesn't happen i i agree but one of the and things, and that's what that's the difference but, between the the but, cultural shift that you talked about thirty years, but what, sodomy laws, all that stuff. We're going to be back right after the break. We're going to take uh, 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 listen to our sponsors. So please tune in. After we get back, we're going to touch just a little bit more on um, on the slippery slope of Doma, and um, then we'll get on to uh, the seven billion dollars we're sending to Africa, which is just outrageous in my opinion. Um, you're listening to webcast one live.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back right after the break. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Hey, welcome back. This is Lefty with Doc and Lefty. We're we're talking. We're kind of finishing up our talk about uh, 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 same sex marriage and the Doma decision. I, for one, don't think that it went far enough. Doc thinks that maybe there's a slippery slope. Doc, you want to talk a little bit about well, uh, about, well about that? First of all, I need to clear up. I do not advocate pedophilia in any way. 
I believe 100% that you can't have a meaningful relationship of an amorous nature with a child. It just doesn't happen. All right. And so I want to make sure people understand that I, I am not for pedophilia in any way. Oh, and, uh, I, and you know, during yeah. the break, I misunderstood what oh, you were okay. saying to me. I thought that you were saying linking pedophilia and homosexuality. No, and I, I do not I, link that. And I nope. feel, and I feel that that's what you were. Oh, yeah. Not that you were advocating. Not that you were accept. Hey, let's all get on the pedophilia bus and go down to pedophilia town. No, <laughs> yeah, okay. no, Doc. Yeah, all sorry right. about well, that, Doc. You, well, then let me clarify this: pedophilia. And I've said this on the show, and in fact, on Facebook, uh, Steve Dace and I every once in a while, you know, get into a little. Uh, not a shout and match, but, you know, pedophilia has nothing to do with homosexuality. They're two completely different things. It's like the difference between, um, you know, chairs and a moon rock. All right. There's no there's no connection at all between them. Part of what Blake has successfully done for me is describe exactly how the slippery slope happens. It's a cultural shift. Well, 30 years ago, there's been no way it would have gay marriage would have passed. 20 years ago it was fairly inconceivable. 10 years ago, people were going like, hmm, boy, we better start introducing DOMA, right? And now it was like, well, geez, you can get married. Well, now Blake's own statements. Well, you know, if three people decide to get together and they're going to be a cherry thing equally and it's not going to be abusive, just a lovely relationship, then I really don't have a problem with that. That's my point. That's the slippery slope. Now, people talk about pedophilia and bestiality. Um, Blake hit it right on the head. There's a lot of legal precedents from way back. That isn't going to change. But the other thing that people don't bring up is incest. Right now, there's a professor from Columbia, and every once in a while, I talk about him. Um, he and his daughter are in an incestuous relationship. She's of age. They want to get married. The defense that they're using for extradition to the U.S., is, well, hold on. If gays can get married, why can't we get married and, and have this uh, incestuous relationship? That's that's their defense. Gay They're, siblings can't get married. Well, I'm just saying that that's this guy's defense. So at what point do you go? That's a ludicrous. that the pro, And you know, the problem with. But, but we're talking the slippery slope. You said it was a silly thing, and it's not a silly thing. Here's here's the issue that I have. It. And All why right, it's we so have a phone call? Oh, we, we we do. We, I I had a feeling that we might have one. All right. Well, here, put the headphones on. I can't. I'll grab mine somewhere. All right. So, who do we have on the uh, the line? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, this is Tim. Hey, Tim. What's up? Hey, I just wanted to disagree with uh, Doc there for a quick second. Uh oh. Oh my. This God. doesn't happen very often. Yeah, that's happening. <laughs> um, you know what? I think the conservatives are wrong on this point. I think that gays should be allowed to be married. I think the real travesty here is the fact that the government is recognizing not political points, but church points in this whole thing. I think they need to say, Hey, everyone's got a civil union. We do not recognize marriage, just civil unions. And then, Conservatives have nothing to bitch about anymore. Thank you very they, much, hey, Tim. They're not married. They're civil unions. I, you know, I, I really, I couldn't agree more. To tell you the truth, I really couldn't. There, this, this sort of uh, state recognition of a religious tradition has always been problematic to me, and uh, and I've been married before. <laughs> so yeah, well, so have I. Yeah, so there you go. But uh, so, but so, Tim, do you? Would you? From I mean. I know that you're more you you tend towards more the libertarian, so it doesn't surprise me very much that you would take this position. But maybe we could help rehabilitate some of our conservative friends out there. Isn't there anything? Is there anything more conservative than the idea of protecting established families, and that the rec, that the uh, the argument that these aren't real families is a religious argument that has no place in a public discourse of this nature? What do you think about that? Well, you know what? I would say that conservatives need to move more toward um, the Constitution. Instead of sitting there and basing everything they say off of their religion, they need to move toward the Constitution and say, hey, guess what? Constitution says separation of church and marriage. That's what we're going to go with. Or church and state. That's what we're going to go with um, on every issue. Just be like, hey, this is what the Constitution says. And stop bringing their religion into it the whole time. I, I don't have a lot. I, you know, Tim, you and I usually go around and around. There are people in the United States that 
really don't believe in religion all that much. Well, I'm going to tell you where the libertarian views come from. Well, and, 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 you know, as far as libertarian, you know, I, you know, there's, there's, I mean, getting straight back to the constitution is great. The problem that I keep telling my conservative compatriots is this is a giant tidal wave that you guys have not seen coming. And you guys at the last minute provided DOMA. Really, mm-hmm. if you if DOMA didn't exist, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Supreme Court wouldn't have made its ruling. Uh, the judges three years ago, what, four years ago now, made the decision in April. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it wasn't for DOMA, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. What platform no, can, you, can you launch, right, that isn't going to somehow run afoul of the Constitution because you can't deny property rights? So my thing to my conservative compatriots has been, listen, state has a right to regulate marriage. We've all agreed to that. We all, well, those of us who have been married before, we've all gone down and signed that paper. Those of us have been mm-hmm. divorced, we understand the cost of marriage. Yeah, it's, it's a pain <laughs> in the butt. Oh, it's a terrible price. And the bottom line is nobody said anything about the state not being able to regulate it. My thing is, now let's separate the state from the religion, just like just like Tim said. That's my position. Let's get well, it in place fun. that if your if your church does not believe in gay marriage, you should not have to perform marriage ceremonies between same sex couples. And I don't think that there's anybody on the same sex side that has argued that that's something that should happen. Well, no. there's been, you know, well, you know, you get crackpots on your side. There happen, are people but... out there that have said that, but you know, you need to be able to to utilize that protection. And I think that we should be able to protect, you know, separate church from state as far as the marriage thing. Goes. But I, um, mm-hmm. I, I heard on, a, I was listening to um, to Andrew Sullivan. If you remember Andrew Sullivan, he's a he's a homosexual uh, conservative uh, commentator from England lives or he's a he's a US citizen but he's from he's from Great Britain and you know 10 years ago he did an article he's a journalist he did an article for um I think it was time about uh about gay marriage and sort of was the kind of the one of the first media salvos into this topic and got a lot of blowback or it might have even been 20 years ago uh got a lot of blowback from conservatives and and also from the uh, not well not from conservatives at the time but from the the actual from uh, homosexual leftists saying we don't want to be considered to be we don't want marriage because we don't want to be a part of the structure we we're we're trying mm-hmm. to to change social structures completely and he said no the conservative argument is to normalize that relationship and it was the religious blowback from that that really sparked this whole gay you know same sex movement and, and it blew up in everybody's face his whole point is. If conservatives are all about protecting families and personal responsibility and personal relationships that the state really has no say over whatsoever, it's just between you and your your community and your religion, if you have one, what's more conservative of an ideal than that? And that argument got hijacked by just what Tim said, by the by religious organizations that wanted to make hay out of the icky gay people. And so that's really... And that really is what's lost it for not just not just for for conservative politicians that want to uh, sort of campaign on this, but lost it for anti marriage equality people for the entire culture, because we're never going back now. Yeah. They've lost the argument. Um, thanks for tuning in, Tim. Thanks for calling in. We always appreciate your uh, your input. We're going to be back right after the break. This these commercials support our studios. Please tune in and support the people that support us. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on webcast1live.com. Lead owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, 
um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. person is hey welcome back everybody you see you caught, caught you. you caught the very rare when we do outtakes for this show folks it's going to be a treasure trove of doc and i swearing at each other getting the boxing gloves out maybe a little bit of cuddling maybe every once in a while i just haven't talked only I, with frank i haven't we don't talk, cuddle with each other just no, with frank i haven't talked him into it yet folks but keep your fingers crossed so anyway because i've heard frank is a, a strong supporter of gay marriage <laughs> that i don't oh I, you didn't find that funny I, sorry no, frank no I, that's that's not we don't want to we want to tread lightly in that particular yes, arena because he can cut us both off he could cut us both off that'd be awful um but i so you have uh some pretty serious opinions about the new investment package that um, President Obama that the, yeah. has has promised to Africa in the way of it's it's a lot of it's got foreign aid in it, but a lot of it's got a lot of good investment opportunities. So why don't you well, kind yeah. of tell people explain set it up for us? Well, here, here's the thing. Now I'm all for it. now. Um, I have done one mission trip to to South Africa, and that that's heartbreaking. And it's South Africa, which is the wealthiest country in Africa, so I can only imagine what these other Sub countries are like. I think Nigeria makes more, at least as much money. Oh, you G think so? GDP-wise, yeah. All right. Well, whatever. I mean, this was the crown jewel of Africa for years and years. And if this is the crown jewel, dude, they're, they're hurting. One of the major things is they don't have power, right? They don't have power that, that's reliable. If you think about all the things we enjoy, flush toilets, all right? Flush toilets are great. They really help sanitation. Um, sanit uh, where we go, the, the sanitation ponds, where we clean up our water, right? All those things require power. You have to have a pump to get, you have to power a pump to the top of the, of the uh, um, water towers in order to create the pressure that we get so that when we flush, when we turn on the water, it all flows. You have to have power for that. If you don't have power, you're stuck, you know, either hauling it to the top in buckets or you go without water. That's very important. Number two, in order to get around, think of how much power we have to have, right? Especially in this day of green technology where we have our hybrids and our uh, plug-in cars and the rest of it. Three, you have to have power to have lights. Lights, strangely enough, is one of the things that keep criminals at bay. Now, the problem is, is, you know, I'm a big advocate of, of gun ownership and being able responsible for your gun. So when you're walking down a dark alley, if you don't have to walk down a dark alley, generally you don't have to worry about crime. So these are all issues that are important. 
two Africans and other third world countries. So when I first read the headlines of the $7 billion, I thought to myself, you know, you know, I really, as an American, I, I can see that. And then I saw a few patients and then I had a lunch break. So I was reading up on it. Turns out, because I thought it was going to be a worldwide thing, like, you know, UN, you know, people going to, nope, United States our, ourselves going to donate $7 billion over the next seven years. That's a billion dollars a year. And there's an aid package, there's direct money, there's uh, all kinds of other things. Like if you want to go over there and try to build, you know, power stations and the rest of it, all this is in there. Well, the number one beneficiary of this, I mean, if you look at who's behind Power Africa, number one, one of the big ones is GE, who I've talked about several times before. Yeah, uh, that Emil guy, the CEO there, is tight with Obama. And GE didn't hasn't paid any taxes for three years. None. Right? Hold on a second. Are you are you advocating that a statist economy is no good, that that corporate welfare isn't a very good strategy for creating growth and developing nations? I, I will tell you. Stop I, the presses. Well, you do this every time. I've said corporate welfare, no way. I mean, the worst capitalist in the world are other capitalists. It's true. Right? And but, so that's my thing. I'm going to step in but, here. But here we are with, in sequester, cutting troops, cutting everybody's benefits, you know, doing everything we can to punish the American people per Obama's directive. We're giving $7 billion to Africa, and specifically uh, a large chunk of that is going to go to GE and despots over there. What I'll say is that the aid package to Africa is less about aid and more about investment opportunities and market solutions to Africans' problem. People that sort of analyze the African situation have been saying for years that we need that they need we need to be able to develop secure markets for people to be able to uh, to develop businesses on their own and try and gain a little bit of economic freedom. Because what kills despotism faster than a vibrant free market? You'd agree with that. You're talking. You're talking to somebody who's got a, a socialist bent to his economics, advocating that uh, markets bring down dictators faster than uh, than guns do. They re- really do, because then you can't really swap out a dictator for a dictator. So there's a, there's a lot more investment opportunities in this package for built for making the the infrastructure investments that Africa needs to to keep up with the growth that they've had over the last 20 years. I mean, 20, uh, 30, 40 years ago. There were there were no credit markets. People weren't using uh, leverage to buy property in Africa. That that uh, Black Africans didn't have smartphones. That they didn't have internet access. They didn't have all the things that now you know, these new generations of the last ten years have beginning getting more of and becoming more and more connected to the outside world faster and faster than ever. They need the, the infrastructure to be able to support that. Also, and and if we if we don't get involved, if America doesn't get involved. The, you know, the other president who was over there, uh, who's been over there more times than than we have over the last few years is China. China wants that trade relationship because because China knows that as um, as American gets more energy independent and starts bringing manufacturing back to its own shores, goods shipped from China bought up by Americans are going to get more and more expensive for the Chinese to produce and send over here. And we're going to start buying less and less and less. They need more emerging markets to sell their products to. The trade and as do we for the same exact reason. The more we manufacture, the more we can export. We need that relationship with China, and this is a good first step towards uh, setting up those fundamentals from an administration that has ignored Africa except to run drone strikes and lead from behind in Libya. Are are you are you criticizing Obama on that one? I criticize Obama for a lot of things. Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just you know going agreed. Now, I agreed on the Obama of leading from behind, but we're going to be back right after this break. I'm going to tell you exactly why this isn't going to work, uh, this Power Africa. Uh, I would love, I'd love it to work, but it isn't. I mean, we're going to be back right after the break. You're listening to us on webcast1.com. Actually, we're not going to take a break because I forgot to bring in the commercials for our, for our sponsors because that's the kind of you know leadership I have, I guess. Um uh, Des Moines Anesthesia, again, they're a pain management specialist. Dr. Iqbal here in town, Dr. Kent Krosky up in Fort Dodge. Um, 
you know, there, it's difficult to get good quality pain management. There's their number, 515-244-3700. Uh, they're more than happy to take your call and get you in. They accept all insurances. Also, our good friends over at uh, Polk County uh, uh, GOP, uh, that's uh, right there it is, 280-6438, polkgop.com. Uh, feel free to go check them out. Uh, take a look at what they got going on. I know Bill Northey has a uh, has a fundraiser coming up. Uh, Senator Whitver's uh, uh, picnic was last weekend. That was a smashing success. And uh, we want to thank them for their sponsorship of our show. The last thing I want to mention, because we, we, I started out at the beginning of the show meaning to say this, but happy birthday to uh, our uh, friend of the show, Tom Shaw. Um, I'm sure he's up uh, having a giant donut cake. Oh, that's pretty cute, Frank. You send up a bunch of balloons. Can you do that again? So anyway, happy birthday to Tom Shaw. Um, anyway, he's, you know, having a good time eating donut cake up there. Oh, there you go. That's pretty cool. Now, we're going to get back to why Blake is wrong about Power Africa. I'm all for foreign investment. I'm all for corporations going over there and trying to operate in their system over there. I'm all for that. I'm all for providing food for people in starving countries. I'm all for that. Here's the problem. It is well known that foreign aid is what props up despots over there. Idi Amin is a good example. Oh, that was Excuse Blake me. over there. He's uh, hacking along up. Excuse me. Um, but Idi Amin is a good example. If it wasn't for foreign aid, he wouldn't have been able to to take control. Um, there's a lot of uh, the Mugabe from Zim. I think he's from Zimbabwe. Um, if it wasn't for foreign aid, he couldn't maintain control. This is what we're talking about. If it wasn't for foreign aid, Muammar Gaddafi wouldn't have been able to stay in power as long as he did. This is the problem with foreign aid to Africa. And that is our intentions are good, but we have to give it to the leadership. Otherwise, they won't let it in. So we have to filter all of our money, all of our corporate things, all the way through these despots over there. Now, but, but this isn't this isn't what they're doing. This is not direct aid given to the leader to be distributed amongst the people. This is um, marshaling together private investors to go over and build factories. Well, what do you think those people are going to do? They're not going to be able to build a factory over there without giving bribes to the leader. I mean, for crying out loud, Kazakhstan is sitting on one of the largest uh, deposits of oil in the world, but they won't. Nobody can build there. BP just got done taking a run at them, and you know why? Because the despot over there said you're going to have to pay us this much money before you can drill. At least the Eastern Bloc straightforward about it. There's an airline called Aeroswit in um, in Ukraine, and they're supposed to be coming much much more of a market economy than anything in in, in Africa, with the exception of maybe the Gambia or uh, South Africa, and yet they got held up. They had to shut down the airlines because uh, government officials came in and said, well, we need more money. You have to bribe us more. This is in Ukraine, which is a fairly Western country. This is what's going on in South Africa. So, yeah, you can give the money to GE. You can provide incentives for them to go, but when GE shows up, Whoever's in charge, let's say it's Mugabe, because I think Zimbabwe's on this list. No, it's not. It's not? The, the six countries are Kenya, Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, Tanzania, and Nigeria. Now, oh, Liber terrific. Liberia. Liberia has, has its own problems, but Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. Ethiopia has a ton of problems. The Ethio Ethiopia's a, a, Ethiopia a, success, a success story. Ethiopia has a democratically elected uh, government. They've come all the way back. They're held up oh. as like the success story. You know, that... Hey, yeah, remember well, the 1980s? That's not Ethiopia anymore. Well, well, I'm not going to do a gotcha game, but but the stuff I read this afternoon, the guy that runs it there uh, simply appointed himself, the, the, the person that ran Ethiopia died, and he appointed himself the person that's running the show now. So there's no democratically elected things. Now, I might be wrong. Usually Blake is right on the ball if he's going to call me out on something, but I, I'm going to disagree with him. But the bottom line is, is you have places there uh, that have despots. And these people are going to demand their own cut of the action going by. And that's just going to reinforce their power over there. That's why it's not going to work. That's why foreign aid to these countries has never worked. I mean, we pour billions and billions of dollars into these countries. It doesn't work. We, we pour billions of dollars uh, into Egypt. Look where they're at. We pour billions of dollars into 
um, Jordan, you know, and they're still, uh, you know, a despot, right? Simply because they call him a king doesn't mean he's a despot. So, I mean, I'm all for it, but I'm kind of surprised that you're taking the tack that, you know, geez, during times of sequester, we should be spending $7 billion on foreign investment when we should be spending $7 billion keeping our troops, you know, well the, supplied. The guy, uh, we're not spending the money, though. That's the whole thing. Well, who's spending the money? Because it's quite clear in there. That Marshalling private investment, public and private partnerships. Well, Wait. the public part, where's the public part coming from? Well, if I, I don't, I, there, the $7 billion is not $7 billion from the government. Not 100%. No, not it's 100%. The to, it's well, the total say, amount of the investment. Let's say it's $2 billion. Okay, I don't know how much it is, but let's say it's that, $2 That hasn't billion. been released yet. We can't really talk about it. Well, <laughs> but let's say it's $2 billion. So can we agree that uh, hypothetically it could be $2 billion? I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't engage in hypotheticals. And now we get to the heart of the issue, and that is we don't know. It just we got do, announced the other day. But we do know that it's going to be public funds. It's it not going to be. You just said it was going to be public funds. It's the the government is. They've changed the t- paradigm. It's no longer direct federal aid to c- the heads of states of these countries. It is marshalling funds among several private corporations to go over and invest. Effort there, we would do it anyway. But the government is helping to facilitate that relationship as a way to develop the power infrastructure that Africa needs to take that next step into the 21st century. That's all it is. It's there. It's not the same sort of stuff that we saw back in the eighties. It's not the same sort of thing we saw in the nineties. And it's not the same kind of aid packages that have been signed by Republican and democratic presidents alike up until this point. All right. Well, I have a list of uh, at least a partial list. The United States will commit more than $7 billion in financial support over the next five years to this effort. Oh, over five years. So I misspoke earlier when I said seven, including the U.S. Agency for International Development. That's the U.S. funded agency. They're donating $300 million. Uh, then they have OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, then the U.S. Export Import Bank. That's also publicly funded. $5 billion. So we're talking about uh, I mean, just in two cases, we're talking $5.3 billion in two directly funded by U.S. taxpayer th- uh, 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 administrations going out there uh, or um, departments giving money to, to Africa. When, in fact, we could use, I mean, $285 million. We could use $85 million of that to end our own sequester here. That's my point. Tell, tell Congress well, to sign the legislation. You're blaming well, the president for this, and it's Congress's responsibility. Cong- Congress was the one that set this up right well, from the beginning. Well, but, but you don't think just spending more and more money is a good – you think spending more and more money overseas is the way to go, and that's going to help foreign, our the economy. Foreign, the foreign it's not going to help us. It's not going to help our economy. The foreign aid budget has is such a small drop in the bucket from everything that we do GDP-wise and, and everything that we spend money on just for our, in our own domestic policy, that decreasing foreign aid is not going to help us here at home either. However, modest increases in foreign aid or even leaving foreign aid at the levels that they're currently at have drastic positive effects around the world. So to, to suggest that we're going to solve our own sequester, sequestration problems by decreasing foreign aid, you know, you know what would uh, solve sequester for Congress to get off its butt and actually do something instead of trying to ban Obama or trying to repeal Obamacare for the 37th time and helping prop up anti-abortion legislation around the country. That's what would help end the sequester. Well, now I agree with you that they need to get off their butts, get a budget, get it over the Senate, and make those guys vote. John Boehner, I've already said this. I've called for John Boehner to step down. He's uh, oh my God! So you drug me off the subject again. Nope. The subject is we're the subject is the people that sponsor us, and we're going to be back right after the break. <laughs> we're going to be back right after the break. Please stay tuned. We're going to get into Paula Dean for the last this, ten minutes. Yeah, we promise. We're, we're, what are we? We're doing? talking about Paula Dean Paula for the Dean, last ten yes, minutes. That's right. Racism. We're going to be back. We're going to talk about Paula Dean. I got a couple of text messages, uh, and we'll respond to those when we get back. You're listening, Doc and Lefty, on webcast1live.com. 
dance party. Kitty's is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitty's, we've always got your birthday party planned with birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitty's where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about birthday Fridays at kittiesusa.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for sticking around to this last segment. We've had a pretty uh, fun discussion here for the past 50 minutes, and I don't think that those last 10 minutes is going to be any different. So we all know that our favorite racist... Who? Paula Dean oh has been God. ousted from her show. Oh She's having God. a complete and total professional meltdown. And you know, honestly, I'm interested to hear your take on this because I can't think it. Every time I hear a new person come out and, and defend this schmuck, I just, I can't. Who, Paula Dean. Yeah. I mean, what's, I, I I have a hard time even coming up with a coherent argument in her like in her defense because there it, it were I felt like we were so kind of just far past you know the knee jerk uh, oh the PC thugs are getting on somebody with someone like this that it just I, what you talk and I'll just kind of tell you why you're wrong how about uh, that no no I don't you get to talk about why it's good to. to to destroy Paula Dean the way she did, even after she apologized, even after she changed, she said she changed her ways. So, because the incident I think that we're talking about, uh, she admitted that she'd used that word way back when. That's and, not the. That's really not the whole story. All right. Well, tell us what the, the whole, whole story is. The whole story is that Paula Dean, throughout her entire professional career, running restaurants, even before she had this show, her entire sort of like food empire that she was building before she got on the food network was just a bastion of just old antebellum racist thinking. I mean, I, I, I went on, I was looking for a couple, like a summary of the, what the complaint, the employment complaint, which was filed by a female white employee, by the way, who was fed up with the, what was going on. Now, just a, a quick aside, employers in this country are um, required to provide a safe and uh, uh, respectable workplace. You, if you feel unsafe in your workplace, that employer has a lot to answer for. And uh, racist, abusive tactics are really kind of a core problem, and you would agree with that. Here's a summary of the complaint and some of the things that were going on, aside from the fact that she once dropped the N-word in a conversation. I'll, I'll even skip over that part. Black staff had to use the back entrance to enter and leave the restaurant. Black staff could only use one bathroom. Black staff couldn't work the front of the restaurant. Brother Bubba stated his wishes. I I could put all of those folks, you know okay. what I mean, in the kitchen on a boat to Africa. Bubba asked a black driver and security guard, don't and, and this and this is her brother who worked for her at all her restaurants. She is direct supervision over him. Don't you wish you could scrub all that black off and be like me? You just look dirty. I bet you wish you could. Paula's son, Jamie, uh, Paul and Paula Dean, right. same so, things so get, that she said. So we get the idea. She, she is, has admitted to all this. This is this was the basis of the complaint, and all these things were well, ver- the, verified in these depositions she took. That's what this whole thing came to light. But so she said, "Yeah, all this stuff happened yeah. in the deposition." So she gets on a, on there, apologizes, and says she's going to change her ways and make things good, right? Just like. Senator Robert Byrd was a Ku Klux Klan member, said, hey, I saw the light. I'm going to change my ways. And everybody went, great. He actually used the N-word, uh, what, at, towards the end of his career. Nobody said a word. Everybody went, oh, 
well, you know, he's one of us. He's a liberal. He's a Democrat. It's good. Is there anything? I don't I don't know what Paul Dean's politics are. I don't think it's ever that's even relevant to the, the conversation. No, it isn't. But it is relative to if if, you know, look at these rap CDs. I mean, different they, thing, completely different. But it so why is it different? If you're talking about the same thing and you do and you eliminate whites that work for you. Right. Let's say they? let's say. If they had, well, you know, the, that Van Winkle fella, Van uh, Ice, Vanilla Vanilla Ice. Ice. what about him? He's He said for several years, you know, yeah, he was the only white guy there because he could rap. And then Suge Knight, you know, threatened him and the rest of this stuff. That's because Vanilla Ice was an idiot. Well, but, he, but it doesn't matter. The whole, the, the whole story is not about race, about Suge Knight being a thug. Well, and that's true, too. But what I'm saying is, you know, you have these rap CDs that use the very same words. Now, if what she's if what she has done is true and she's admitted it, then of course you know I think there should be blowback. But I don't think you should have to lose everything you have because of it. I think that you it should give somebody an opportunity to change. Well, she the thing you know? she's already she was already on the way out because of the whole diabetes thing. Yeah, you that's have, true. You have the she had the whole comfort food Southern yeah. deal was completely like her empire was rocked because of that. And this is just sort of piling on, but I'll tell you why uh, rappers dropping the N bomb in CDs is different from uh, a white employer doing it. Number one, it's when, when they're not using like rappers are not using that particular word in the same demeaning racist context. Now it's, it's an offensive word for anybody. And I, there, and the, the jury in the African American community, as far as I've been ever, ever able to tell is split. Some people think it's empowering, taking the word back away from the folks that use it to abuse people. Some just think it's, it's, it should be, it's disgusting and should be uh, consigned to the Ashman history. But when you come, when it comes right down to it, it is different for a white employer to use that word against black employees than it is for a black rapper to use that in a song about his experience. That's right. the two are completely different. So, so if you're using a racist term such as cracker and you're black against somebody that you perceive as white, is that racism? Yes. And if that's it's just a, as bad. You mean in a black a black employer doing the same sort of thing doing and the same using sort as, of thing? and using it with the intention of demeaning and and denigrating absolutely. that person? That's yeah. a, yes, it absolutely well, is. Then we're going to segue right into Trayvon Martin because we only got about a minute, two minutes left for this. This particular thing, um, part of the part of the thing about Trayvon Martin is uh, George Zimmerman uh, was at first characterized as being white because he he is he he looks white. All right, he doesn't look as white as Blake does. No, nobody does. <laughs> but he's looking pretty pretty white. Well, he says, "Well, there's a creepy ass uh, cracker coming up on me." Well, there's racism, and then the person that's supposed to be the star witness for the prosecution says. Well, yeah, I use that term all the time for whites, you know, being derogatory. Yeah, something that mm -hmm. goes on. Well, when you have a case that's motivated primarily by race, right? At least that's how the, more, the, the media is portraying it. When you look at the facts, who is the racist? Are they both racist? Let's say for a fact that uh, 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 George Zimmerman said, well, listen, I see this black kid running around in my neighborhood. I don't follow that, and, you know. Well, and then the other kids, the Trayvon Martin says, well, you know, I'm going to get this cracker or whatever he said, you know, because George uh, Zimmerman said something like that. Well, now you have a case of two racists going after each other. What is that really the, the cost? Is that really the issue? The issue really should be what happened and the media should stay out and report facts instead of trying to drum up, you know, a, a problem that doesn't exist. I would agree to the extent that the media convicted George Zimmerman before he was even charged with anything, and that was yes. wrong. And that's why I don't, why I personally stay away from national media trials because that should be between the community where the crime happened and the twelve jurors in the box. That's it. Those are the only people who are interested in that case. Those are the only people who should be interested in that case. Everything else is distraction, and it does and it um, doesn't get justice for the victim, and it doesn't get justice for the defendant. And this is a criminal defense lawyer talking to you about this stuff. I don't like it, and I know I've never liked it. But the central, for me, the central part of this case, and you know who, how a lot of those questions would be answered, and how a lot of that controversy would be put to bed, 
is if we could hear from Trayvon Martin, but we can't because George George Zimmerman shot and killed him. That's the issue, and the well, and they, the and and whether or not he was justified in taking that level of force against another human being. That's the question of fact that the jury has to determine. And so whether or not George Zimmerman was following him because he had a preconceived notion of what a black kid wearing a hoodie would do in a particular community where he, quote unquote, shouldn't be. That's the motivation that has to either be proven beyond a reasonable doubt or used to acquit him of these charges. That's, That's case it. case closed. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate your support and your uh, uh, sponsorship. We'll be back next week from 6 to 7 p.m. here on webcast1live.com. Thanks for tuning in to Doc and Lefty. Can't wait. Hi, I'm Representative Tom Shaw, and I love these guys. Both of them. Love these guys. <laughs> Get over here. Get over here. Love both of them.